Would you please now turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke. Luke chapter 1, and we'll be looking at the prophecy of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. Luke chapter 1, verses 67 to 79. This is in Luke's infancy narrative concerning not only the birth of John the Baptist, but the birth of Jesus. Luke 1, verse 67. This is the word of God. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Please underline that sentence, to remember his holy covenant. The oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, referring to John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful prophecy of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist. We thank you that it points us to our Lord Jesus Christ and how he fulfills the promises of old. We thank you that at this time of the year, as we reflect upon the Advent season and prepare ourselves for the celebration of the birth of our Savior. We thank you that you have given us this opportunity to reflect upon the wonderful promises of the scriptures and how they are all fulfilled in Christ. In his name we pray, amen. So I've been preaching an Advent series, a three-part Advent series titled the promised offspring, which of course is taken from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the first promise of the gospel that God made to Adam and Eve after they sinned. Recall that promise, which we looked at several weeks ago. God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. We noticed that that promise, that first promise of the gospel, which theologians call the protevangelium, proto meaning first, evangelium meaning gospel. This first promise of the gospel is given to us in the key of holy war. God is creating this enmity between the serpent and the woman and between her offspring and his offspring. It is a declaration of holy war God is promising not to let this newfound allegiance between Adam and Eve and the serpent to stand. He is going to break that allegiance by creating enmity between them. And he is going to engage in holy war until the coming of the promised offspring who will defeat the serpent and bring about the fulfillment of God's promises. We also saw, in addition to looking at Genesis 3.15 itself and unpacking each of those phrases, and focusing specifically on the word offspring, how it has both an individual and a collective meaning, referring to Christ, 
but also referring to his people. We also saw that that promise that was first made in the garden is expanded when God made the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. And actually, it's not just Genesis 12, but the entire section of Genesis that begins in chapter 12 and continues on, uh, the promise is repeated in various ways to Abraham, and then it's repeated again to Isaac and to Jacob. The rest of the book of Genesis, from Genesis 12 to 50, is basically the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic promise. And so we saw that there's a bridge connecting the promise to Abraham with this first promise of the gospel, the pro-evangelium, in Genesis 3.15. And there's a number of things that show us that bridge. One is this use of the word offspring. What is the promise to Abraham? It is, to your offspring I will give this land, which picks up on that same word offspring in Genesis 3. In addition, we also saw the genealogy that connects us from Abraham to Seth, or from Adam to Seth, all the way down to Noah, and then from Noah through Shem, all the way down to Abraham. The genealogy uh, is broken up into two parts. The first half from Adam to Noah is in Genesis chapter 5. The second half from Noah to Abraham is in Genesis chapter 11. But that genealogy is telling us that there is one promise of the gospel, that that promise that God made concerning the offspring in Genesis 3.15 is going to be fulfilled and it's going to come to a greater fulfillment through the promise to Abraham. Now what's interesting is that this promise that God makes to Abraham, which is itself the unpacking of the initial promise to Adam and Eve, this promise that God makes to Abraham has two levels within it. The promise that God makes to Abraham has two horizons within it. God is speaking to Abraham about a promise that's going to be fulfilled in the near term. God is going to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation, the nation of Israel. But he's also speaking ahead beyond that near-term fulfillment to a second fulfillment that lies beyond it. We see that, for example, in Genesis 12, verse 2. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who dishonors you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So you see that far-term horizon as well, don't you? How is God going to bless all the nations through Abraham? Well, we know the answer. We know it's Christ and the gospel, right? God's going to bless the nations. The Gentiles will also be included in this great promise. So what's interesting is that this promise that God makes, and we can define the promise as not just the Genesis 12 promise, but this whole promise that includes the Genesis 3.15 promise as it's fuller, uh, more fully expressed to Abraham, this whole promise from Genesis 3.15 all the way to the end of Genesis, this big promise with a capital P has a Two, two horizons of fulfillment within it, a near-term fulfillment and a far-term fulfillment. The near-term fulfillment is the rest of the story of the Old Testament. We see that God indeed fulfills that promise at the literal earthly level by creating Abraham's descendants into a great nation and then bringing them into the land. To your offspring, I will give this land. That really did happen in history under Joshua. But of course, we know that that fulfillment was not the true and ultimate fulfillment because there is this far-term horizon that is always in the mind of God, which is that he is going to bless the world through Abraham and his offspring. And that, of course, is Christ. And so this creates this very interesting thing. This is really the um, the essence of what the Bible is all about. If you really want to understand what the Bible is, the Bible is about promise and fulfillment. Everyone knows that, right? We speak about how God is fulfilling all of his promises by sending Jesus as the promised Messiah. But what people don't understand is that the fulfillment itself happens in two stages. And that is the thing that is so interesting about the nature of the Bible. The whole Bible is promise and fulfillment, but that second part, fulfillment, happens in two stages. There is an initial earthly literal fulfillment, which we call the type, 
And then there is the ultimate reality fulfillment in Christ, which is the anti-type. That is, it is what the type is pointing to. And because God is spending so much time in history, like just think of all the things that happened in the Old Testament, historically, right? All the stuff that happened with Israel coming out of Egypt, and then they're wandering in the wilderness, and then under Joshua, they go into the land, they begin to conquer the land and take possession of it. And then God eventually brings about the, the establishment of the Davidic monarchy. And then the David and Solomon, they have descendants that come after them. And that ultimately leads to the exile of Israel out of the land and the destruction of the temple. All of that history that God is doing with the nation of Israel is that first level fulfillment. But because it is not the true fulfillment, it's only a typological fulfillment in type and shadow, it is a concrete historical embodiment of the promise. And so in a sense, it becomes another promise, doesn't it? Right? We have the initial verbal promises where God comes to Abraham and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you into a nation. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to bless the world through you. That's verbally. God is making his promises to Abraham. And Abraham believed in those promises and it was counted to him as righteousness because he believed in God's promise. He was justified and saved. And all of his descendants after him also were called to believe in that promise. But that's just the verbal declaration of the promise. What God does then is he fulfills with a earthly uh, typological fulfillment. He fulfills that promise even though it's not the true fulfillment, it's not Christ and the kingdom of God, it's not heaven, it's not the salvation of the elect through the work of Christ and the atonement, it is simply a provisional, concrete, historical fulfillment in the literal land with literal offspring and a literal king, right? But since that promise is being fulfilled in that earthly, historical way, and that historical fulfillment is not the true fulfillment, that fulfillment, the historical fulfillment, which is basically the bulk of your Bible from the book of Exodus all the way to the end of Malachi, the Old Testament, right? It's basically that first level fulfillment. That fulfillment itself becomes another version or form of the promise, right? But this time the promise is being made not verbally, not God saying to God's people, I'm going to do this. Abraham, I'm going to give your offspring the land. But now God is making that verbal promise concrete. He's giving us like a, 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 a concrete expression of the promise that we can hang on to. But we know that it's a promise because it's not the true fulfillment. That's why everything good in the Old Testament, even the best and holiest men, end up falling short. Think of the best and holiest men, the ones that we really look at in the Old Testament as being the heroes, right? We know there's the bad guys, you know, the, the evil kings that served idols and so on, but there are also some seemingly good guys, the real heroes in the Old Testament, that we know that they're genuinely believers, that they are the servants of God, like Moses or like King David. They're good guys, right? They're the ones that are truly doing what God wants. David is a man after God's own heart. Moses is the great leader of God's people who brings them out of Egypt and who gives them the law. And yet even the best and holiest of men in the Old Testament have a flaw. They have something that just falls short, doesn't quite actually meet the fullness of what we're hoping for, right? Remember Moses, he's the most humble man of all. He's the great man of God through whom God gave the law. And yet, remember he sinned that one time when he was upset with the people because they were grumbling and complaining and he struck the rock and out of anger, God said, because he did that, he wouldn't be able to enter into the land. He gave him a chance to go up on Mount Pisgah and look at the land from a distance, but he died outside of the land because he is not the true Messiah. He is not the true king of God's people. He is only a picture and a type of Jesus. Same thing with King David, great man of God. He's a man after God's own heart. He's the one that slew Goliath. He's the one that was anointed with the holy oil that, that Samuel placed upon him and said, this is the one. And yet even King David fell short when he sinned with Bathsheba. And 
he was not the true king. He is not the true fulfillment. But here's the wonderful thing, is that God is giving us these flawed heroes and these flawed fulfillments of his promises in order to make us long even more for the true Moses, for the true David, right? So that these historical, actual embodiments of God's promise, Moses was a real man, David was a real man, these historical embodiments of God's promise become a further expression of God's promise. And that's why then when you turn to the New Testament and the Gospels, the New Testament and the Gospels will then tell us who Jesus is by using all of the symbols and language of the first level fulfillment in the Old Testament. So when we hear who Jesus is, he is described to us as what? He is the son of David, right? He is the Messiah. He is the true king of the kingdom of God. He is the true lawgiver on Mount, just like Moses gave the law on Mount Sinai, Christ on the mountain. He gave us his law, the law of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount, explaining to us the true meaning of the law of Moses. And so Jesus then is described to us in the New Testament, and in particular in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as the fulfillment of the first level fulfillment. The first level fulfillment is only the pic picture fulfillment. It's only a, only a type and shadow, and it's flawed, and it doesn't completely lead to the fulfillment of God's promises, but it is a promise itself. And so when Christ then comes, we're able to understand the meaning of who Christ is and what he's accomplished in light of all of the symbols and the language that is used and given to us in the nation of Israel. And there's so many different symbols that are used, right? Just think of all the different symbols that are used to describe who Jesus is. I already mentioned that he is the true lawgiver, that he is the true Davidic king, he's the son of David, but there's so many other symbols as well. For example, what is one of the main things that Jesus talks about in his ministry? What is the main theme of his teaching? It is the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is pro that was promised in the Old Testament is now here because he's the king of the kingdom of God. That language of kingdom is taken from the first level fulfillment. That is what God made Israel into. God was forming and fashioning Israel into a kingdom dwelling in God's holy land. And so Christ then is announcing that the true kingdom of which Israel was simply a picture has come in his person and work. And so in our text today, which we read in Zechariah's prophecy, the father of John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied saying, here it is, here's the fulfillment. It's starting to happen right now through first the birth of John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah, but ultimately through the Messiah himself. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. You see how all this language is taken from the first level fulfillment is being used to describe Jesus. He is the horn of salvation. He is the one who's coming from the house of David. House meaning like a, a lineage, like a, a monarchic line. He is coming from the dynasty of David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies. Now right here you have a reference to all the way back to the first promise of the gospel. Who are the enemies here? the offspring of the serpent, right? But it's being used here, not in the Adamic sense, all going all the way back to Genesis 3.15, but in the first level fulfillment sense, because who were the enemies of God's people when they went into the land? They were the Canaanites who were dwelling in the land that they had to overcome in order to go into the land. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Now the word remember in 
biblical terminology, when it says that God remembers his covenant, it doesn't mean that God forgot and he's like, oh yeah, I made a promise, now I need to remember it. When the Bible uses this language of remembering his promises or his covenants, it means that he is now beginning to fulfill them. He's beginning to do what he promised. And what's so amazing about this phrase here, he is remembering his holy covenant, and you're asking, well, which covenant is it? Is this the Mosaic covenant? No, it's the Abrahamic covenant, because it tells you in the very next verse, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. So he is now remembering his covenant with Abraham. Now what's so amazing about that is that this is exactly the same language that was used back in the book of Exodus. At the very beginning of the first fulfillment. Remember back in the book of Exodus, you have Exodus chapter 1, which is that the people are becoming numerous, and then they are being used as slaves by Pharaoh, and they're groaning under the burden of being slaves to, to, uh, to Pharaoh, and it says that God heard their groaning, Exodus 2 verse 24. He heard the groaning of his people, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. It's the exact same phrase. Exodus 2, 24 is at the beginning of the first fulfillment. Luke 1, 72 is at the beginning of the second fulfillment. In both cases, God is remembering his covenant with Abraham, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham. I'll never forget the day when I was uh, in class at Westminster Seminary, California. It was in April of 1993. Now you have a sense of how old I am. Um, it was a while ago, so 30 years ago. And I was in class in what's called Pentateuch. This was a class taught by Meredith Klein. He was my favorite professor at Westminster. He was an Old Testament professor. And he taught a class called Pentateuch, which means the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. But don't let that name for the class fool you. It wasn't just about the first five books of the Bible. It was actually an introduction to biblical theology, the entire structure of the Bible. And he's using Pentateuch as the foundation for that, for understanding the whole structure of the Bible in light of the Pentateuch, and especially the book of Genesis. Uh, he wrote a book called Kingdom Prologue, and what he means by that is that the book of Genesis is the prologue to the kingdom of God. The book of Genesis is the prologue, and then the rest of the Bible, from Exodus all the way to the end of the Bible, is the fulfillment. And so in class that one day, in April of 1993, he, draw, he drew a chart on the board that was very simple. It was just a line, and then another line up, and then another line, okay? And maybe for you guys, I'll put it this way. You can start over here with the Abrahamic promise, line this way. That's the first fulfillment with Israel, and then a line up, and then Christ is the second fulfillment this way. So he just made a very simple diagram to describe this idea of two-level fulfillment. And then he placed these verses at the beginning of each of those. So at the beginning of the Abrahamic fulfillment, or the first level fulfillment, he wrote Exodus 2.24. And at the beginning of that top line, he wrote Luke 1.72. Because both verses are telling you that God is now fulfilling his promise to Abraham. The entire Bible is promise and fulfillment, but that fulfillment section happens in two stages. And the first fulfillment is not the true fulfillment. But because it's not the true fulfillment, it becomes a further amplification of the promise. So that now we can see what is it that God is going to do? What is it going to look like when Christ comes? It's going to be something awesome. You know, every child knows the gospel. It's the simplest thing in the world. It's not a complicated thing. Everyone knows the gospel, which is what? I'm a sinner, and Jesus died for my sins so that I can be saved. That's the gospel. That's all you need to know. Well, maybe you could add in some other things like you need to know the deity of Christ. But basically, that's all you need to know, right? I'm a sinner, and Jesus died for my sins. That is the gospel. 
And every child can understand that. Every child of God can understand that. But there is so much more to that. It's going to take a lifetime. It's going to take eternity in heaven, right? To fully plumb the depths of what that means. Why did God give us this giant book with so much history in it and so much discussion about Israel and the nations and the Gentiles and all this discussion about complicated things about the land and kings and kingdoms and so on. Why did he do that? It wasn't to make the children confused, although sometimes even the adults get confused, right, because the Bible is a complicated book. But he gave it in order to give us a clearer and fuller understanding of what that simple gospel really is. Saying that Jesus died for my sins is wonderful. And that's all I need to know to be saved. I just need to trust in Christ. But there's so much more to understand that, to unpack that, to bring out the fullness of it. And that is what the whole Bible is doing. It is giving us the language. It's giving us the symbolic tools to be able to truly understand and grasp the fullness of what the gospel is. It is so much more than just simply knowing that I myself am a sinner and I need my sins to be forgiven. It is the kingdom of God. The gospel is that God is bringing about the kingdom that was originally offered to Adam in the garden, but which he failed to achieve because of his disobedience, but which God is promising to accomplish through the second Adam, through the offspring of the woman. The gospel is something marvelous and glorious we begin to see in light of the fullness of the teaching of Scripture that the gospel is this massive, I'm, I'm thinking of different illustrations to explain this, but it's something big. It's something massive. It's like a mountain that's coming out of the earth. It's like a, a temple, a glorious temple that's being built with Christ the foundation and the cornerstone, and we, the living, living stones, being built up into that glorious temple. It is something amazing and glorious. One way that we could get a glimpse of that is by going back again to the promise that God made to Abraham. Go back to Genesis 12 and look at verses 6 through 8. Genesis 12, 6 through 8. And note that there are three ideas that are found here. First of all, in verse 6, it says that at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. This is the second half of the verse, so verse 6b. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Oh, whoa. Now we're seeing that there's something bigger going on here than just Jesus died for my sins, right? There's some kind of holy war that's happening here. The Canaanites are in this land that God is promising to give to Abraham. Then you have the promised inheritance in verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, even though the Canaanites are in the land, to your offspring, I give this land. And then in verse 8, what does Abraham do in response to that promise? So he built there an altar to the Lord. He built an altar. So there's the Canaanites in the land. That doesn't seem good. They don't belong there. But God is promising to give this land to Abraham's offspring. And as a expression of Abraham's faith in that promise and as a expression of God's claim upon that land remember Abraham is in the land but he doesn't really own it yet because the Canaanites are there he's just sort of kind of like this sojourner he's just wandering around in tents right but as a foreshadow of an anticipation of what God is going to do one day one day the Canaanites will be removed from this land one day, Abraham's offspring will inherit this land, and one day they will build an altar there in that land. Of course, we know what that's going to be. It's going to be the temple, right? It's going to be God's holy presence in the midst of his holy people, where God's people are going to gather together to offer up true worship, not like the worship of the Canaanites, which is idolatrous and evil and wicked and involves terrible things like sacrificing their children to their gods. God is going to destroy the enemy. He's going to bring God's people. First, he's going to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation, and then he's going to bring them into that land. And under Joshua, they did. And they exercised holy war 
and they destroyed the Canaanites, and they took possession of this land that God was promising. But the whole purpose and intent of that was so that God could be worshipped in that holy land. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, it makes this very clear, where Moses is on the verge. Remember, they're on the uh, other side of the Jordan, in the plains of Moab, and they're just about ready to go into the land. Of course, Moses is going to die first, and then Joshua is going to bring them in, but Moses is already preparing them. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, and he explains to them, verse 10, but when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around, does that remind you of something we heard about in Luke 1? Giving us rest from all of our enemies? When he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you will live in safety, then you're not just going into this land so you can have a place to live. You can just have a nice house and enjoy your crops and your, your land. No, you're going in so that then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. This is referring to the temple where God's name dwells in the midst of his people. Then to that place you shall bring your offerings and your sacrifices and worship me there so that God may be truly worshipped. And so back in Genesis 12, verses 6b through 8, we see these three ideas of holy war, promised inheritance to the offspring, and a theocratic claim. That's what it means when, when Abraham built an altar there. That's a theocratic claim where God is making his claim upon this land. This land is mine. This land is for me. This land is the place where I'm going to put my name so that I might be honored and worshiped there as the true and living God and so that the glory of God might fill that land and be a place of worship and honor. God is interested not simply in I have sins that need to be forgiven. Jesus died for my sins so I can be forgiven and go to heaven. God is interested in building an altar in the land. God wants to build this temple. He wants to build this place of glory for his name. And to do so requires holy war. You can't get to the temple until you have the holy war. That's why Jesus, in the fulfillment, he has to do battle with Satan before he can be raised from the dead and exalted to the right hand of God and to begin to build his spiritual temple, the church. There has to be this conflict with the serpent. The serpent has to be defeated. The idolatry must be cleansed from the land. And not only that, but it's not just simply me as an individual getting my own sins forgiven. God is interested in creating a people. He wants a people that will worship him. He wants this blessing of Abraham to go to the nations as well, so that all of God's people might enter into this land, becoming a great nation to worship God and to become this glorious dwelling place for God in the land. And all along, even in the first level fulfillment, there is this promise of the individual offspring as well. There's the corporate offspring, all of God's people worshiping God, the, the seed of the woman, the offspring of the woman, not the offspring of the serpent. But there's also this individual aspect because God's people need a leader. We need a covenant head who can lead us in the true worship of God. Even in Genesis 49, verse 10, there's the promise of the lion of the tribe of Judah, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. And God's promise to David as well. Remember in, in 2 Samuel 7, when God makes that Davidic covenant, and he promises that David will have a dynasty, and God's going to establish his house, it even says right there, the same idea of, I will give you rest from all your enemies. We saw that in Deuteronomy 12. We saw that in Luke 1, uh, verse 71. But in 2 Samuel 7, verse 11, I will give you rest from all your enemies. And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. Just like with the Abrahamic covenant, there's two horizons there, right? When God made the promises to Abraham, to your offspring I will give this land, we have the first level horizon, but then we know it also it's looking beyond that to the fulfillment in Christ. Same thing with the Davidic promise. The Davidic promise has the same two horizons. Who is this offspring that's going to come after him, who will come from his own body, and he's going to be the one who will build the temple? That's Solomon, right? But that's only a first level horizon. And of course we know what happens to Solomon. 
He seemed like a good guy, but also he had flaws. He had many wives, and they drew him away from the Lord, and he allowed them to bring in their idolatry into the land. And so there's a second horizon as well. Who is the offspring that God is promising to David ultimately? It's Christ. I will raise up your offspring after you, and he shall build a house for my name. <laughs> Not like this earthly house that Solomon built made of stone. He's going to build the true temple, which is his church, Christ the head and the church as his body. And that's why between these two fulfillments, the first level fulfillment with Israel and the land and the temple, and the true fulfillment with Christ and his church and his kingdom and his temple, there is this intervening moment which takes up a lot of the Old Testament, which is what? It is the ultimate failure of the first level. It is the exile of Israel out of the land, just as Adam was expelled from the garden because he failed to keep the holiness of God's garden temple. And he allowed the serpent to come in when he should have destroyed the serpent and expelled him from the garden, but yet he became compromised. So also Israel also did the same thing. Just read Judges chapter 1 where it says that they didn't go into the land. They didn't completely destroy the Canaanites. They made treaties with them and they began to compromise and they began to worship the gods of the Canaanites. And so as a result, the first level comes to an end. And it says in Hosea 6 verse 7, like Adam, they transgressed the covenant. Like Adam transgressed the covenant of works in the garden, so Israel transgressed the covenant of works that God made with Israel at Mount Sinai. They failed to execute God's judgment upon the Canaanites. They became compromised. And so the exile then is a reenactment of the fall. It was a God-ordained failure. Don't read the Old Testament and be disappointed and say, man, I wish there was a better ending. No, rejoice in the fact that it's a terrible ending because that was God-ordained to show you that the first level is not the true fulfillment. And therefore, it causes you to long even more for the true fulfillment. The offspring of Abraham is not righteous enough to inherit the land. Instead of maintaining enmity with the Canaanites, they compromise and become like the Canaanites. Psalm 106, 34 says, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, the idols of Canaan. And the individual kings who were to lead God's people in righteousness they failed as well. As go the king, so go the people. If the king is righteous and leading God's people in faithfulness and destroying the altars of the false gods, then God's people are generally obedient to the Lord. But if the king is failing to lead God's people in proper worship of God, then the nation itself becomes corrupt and the whole nation is judged. The individual offspring, which is the monarchy, was also a failure and corrupt. And just as Adam was expelled from the garden, so Israel was expelled from the land in 586 B.C. when the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple. The amazing thing, though, is that in the very moment of tragic failure and judgment, that's when God sends the prophets to tell us about the coming Messiah. Just like in the garden, right? Right in that moment of failure when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they're hiding from God in shame. God makes that first promise of the gospel. So also, when national Israel, as a corporate second Adam, is hiding in shame from God and in, is in exile and captivity, it's then that God raises up the prophets like Isaiah to say, there's going to be a, a, a coming Savior. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is giver, given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. How wonderful it is to know that what God is doing is something wonderful and glorious. It is something bigger than just, I'm a sinner and I need to be saved from my sins and be forgiven. It is this wonderful fulfillment of everything that God had intended from the very beginning. One way you could summarize it is to say, it is the kingdom of God. But another way of putting it is, it is a holy kingdom of God. And what's the term we use for that? It is a theocracy. That is what God wants. He wants a theocracy. Now, of course, we as American democratic people, we don't like that idea. And I'm not advocating for theocracy here in the earthly realm, 
in the common grace realm of civil government. But in terms of what God is trying to do, God wants a theocracy. He set it up initially in the garden, and it failed. He set it up again at the first level fulfillment with Israel in the land, and it failed. But now through Christ, he is bringing about the fulfillment of that theocratic kingdom, the holy kingdom of God. And there's three elements to that. There is the king of the kingdom of God. He's the obedient king who leads God's people in the true worship of God. There's the kingdom people who are under the who are loyal to that king, who are serving that king, who've been redeemed by that king to be the kingdom people. And there's the kingdom realm where the king is reigning in the midst of his holy people. And you see all three in the original promise in Genesis 3.15, the offspring in the land. And you see it with Genesis 12 as well. To your offspring, I will give this land. Of course, the offspring has two aspects to it. The individual offspring, which is the king, and the corporate aspect, which is the king's people, worshiping God in that holy realm. Let us pray. O oh God, thank you for the promise of the coming offspring who would crush the serpent's head. Make us more and more to know that we have victory over the enemy, not in our own strength, for we have none, but because we have been made partakers of Christ's victory. Thank you for the promise that you made to Abraham that he and his offspring would inherit heaven. We thank you that you have fulfilled that promise in Christ. Thank you that since we belong to him, we are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to the promise. We know that we are not worthy to inherit heaven. We are not righteous enough to be the righteous people who dwell in your holy kingdom. But we thank you that you have made us worthy in Christ so that in his name, and in his obedience, in our place, we are able to inherit. In his name we pray. Amen.